Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the 2% Better Health Podcast. I am your host, Carrie Bennett, and today I am excited because we're going to talk about exercise in a different way than people typically think of it. And uh, it's going to be, so I'll talk about how I connected with Jared, right? Jared and I connected on Instagram because apparently we share a mutual acquaintance, uh, uh, Matt Mance, right? Uh, Matt and I did a podcast earlier this year and Matt is just a wealth of information. Uh, and I love how he bridges the gap between traditional training and then also other things like circadian rhythm and now massage and movement and being outside. So, uh, so I'm excited to talk to Jared and Jared, you had me at when you said how exercise can, you know, uh, impact the body and its regeneration capabilities. And you had me at piezoelectricity, basically. It was like, yep, I need, I need to talk to this guy. So Jared, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I'm excited to be on here as well. I've uh, thoroughly enjoyed your Instagram page. I know I'm not as much on it uh, as I used to be, but it's very creative. And so it's a Thank very you. good learning tool. So good job on your end. Oh, thank you. I really, really appreciate that. Yeah, you know, I'm always I'm always interested in connecting with with people who kind of think outside the box when it comes to what you're doing. So talk to me. I know that you it looks like you went to chiropractic school. You work with people to train. But what what got you to where you are and how did you kind of flip the paradigm to say, wait, there's more to exercise than what we're what we're taught exercise really is? Yeah. Uh, so one quick clarification. So I'm still in chiropractic school. Okay. So I'm about done. So I'm about, just about ready to start my student rotations. Uh, cool. So that'd be exciting. I'll be finished. But uh, what I guess occurred all before that was that I was working primarily with uh, athletes. So baseball players, high school baseball players. And I've always had kind of the passion of the physical therapy rehab type uh, of stuff. And, you know, when I was at working at a facility and it seemed like every single night, uh, my athletes would be injured. They would come in back pain, elbow pain, shoulder pain. And, you know, I had this as being like the strength coach role. I had this idea of, you know, all we're going to do is like come in and we're going to lift and the guys are going to get stronger and faster. Um, but I immediately had to take a step back and it's like, people can't even run, right? Right now people can't walk they can't even throw a baseball uh, so I had to really come up with my own creative ways to try and figure out how do I get these athletes out of pain and out of pain as soon as possible so then they can return to their sport um, and then through that whole process of trial and error figuring out what works what not works uh, led me to kind of that which kind of led me to chiropractic school realizing that there was a lot more uh, that you can do to the body um, and so I chose chiropractic because because it's a very powerful stimulus that uh, you can put into somebody's body uh, just through the nervous system and whatnot. So that's kind of where it led me to where I'm at right now. Awesome. That's that's neat. You know, it's a. Uh... I, I feel like we've all kind of had an experience similar to that where we really had to step back and say, wait, wait a second, the, the body isn't always behaving the way we exactly expect it to behave. So then with these athletes, right? So what is your, do you, do you work one-on-one -on -one with athletes still? Uh, yeah. Um, and it's kind of funny. It's kind of transitioned from high school athletes to um, almost like retired athletes, people mm. who are in their forties to sixties who are like, Hey, I want to go and, you know, train for the, um, you know, the elder population of track and field, or, um, you know, I want to be able to throw a hammer or <laughs> so it's, it's kind of switched a little bit, but, um, that's also exciting too, though. I'll say. Yeah, no, that's great because I think, I think younger athletes have a, have a, potential for like all these overuse injuries, right? Just because they've been go, go, go training 24 seven, the same movements for, you know, 15 years of their life. And then now you got the older athletes who may potentially also have a bit of an overuse or an old injury or something. So the, the training strategy then sounds like it's different, right? And so what, what truly do you feel are the benefits of exercise? Like where, where does it cross between like, you know, this idea of, yeah, we got to get big and strong and, and fit versus exercise has the potential to do so much more for our body. Yes. Um, well, and, and I, I gotta say something though. So there's, there's a uh, really no difference in how I'm going to train the 60 year old versus the 15 year old or the 18 year old. Um, 
And so those are going to be the same. And, and essentially what it comes down to is just as, you know, I, I think Dr. Jack Cruz says, uh, um, uh, I think this is where I heard it from, but, but, you know, the further we get from nature, the more trouble we get into. And it's the same for, you know, as a human, where the further away we get from doing human natural movements, uh, then the more trouble essentially we get into, you know, and so nature and humans are intertwined. So whatever happens to nature happens to us and what happens to us happens to nature. So those are two things that we can't really separate. And I know in our fitness industry, that's something that often people will separate is the whole uh, you know, human aspect is not intertwined with nature and they don't kind of see how those parallel together. So I don't know if that answers your question fully, but. No, uh, it's a great, it's a, that's a great segue, right? Because I think the new, the shifting paradigm, the reason, one of the reasons I had to sell my fitness facility during was because, you know, we, we got shut down during COVID and it didn't make sense, but also deep down, I was thinking to myself, I was getting into circadian rhythm. I was getting into more ancestral, ancestral movements. I was getting into blocking the blue light, you know, all these things. And it felt like some sort of a not coherent when I would then open up my gym at five 30 in the morning and flip on all these overhead lights. Right. And it's like, wait, what am I doing? Like, are, are we just saying that the, the, what, the, what we need with exercise is just moving our muscles for a certain through a certain range of motion for a certain number of volumes and rep or reps and sets and under a certain amount of tension. And that's all that's needed. Right. Or am I really just not helping these people because they're working out first thing in the morning under artificial light, I've completely messed with their circadian rhythm. And like, are, am I really messing with the benefits that they could be getting if they were exercising in a different atmosphere in a different way? So where did you go? Like, where are you going with your athletes to help them connect back to nature? Yeah. Um, so I think, um, you know, you, you've already talked a lot about connective tissue. I, I was going back and listening to some of the stuff that you talked about. So you talked about connective tissue, you talked about fascia, you talked about water um, and light. So I, I recommend that people for kind of a base to really go back and listen to those, but I'll try and parallel those two pieces together. Uh, but one of the things that I, I don't think I've heard you mention Maybe you have or not, but um, uh, the idea, of, so what, what kind of caught my attention was the idea of compression and expansion. Mm -hmm. So if we look at everything in the universe, uh, it always has this life death cycle. So, you know, the, the plant grows and then it, you know, we breathe out death and it takes in this death and it uses as life and then it spits out, you know, oxygen for us as life. Uh, so uh, so you see this like mutual relationship and, and this is where I started understanding between the, when I, when I talk about compression expansion is where I'm going to talk about tone. So muscle tone. And then, you know, I think you have massage therapist background and that's one of the things that you learn to assess is that you look at somebody and you look to see where there's excessive tone and where there's no tone. And what I found with athletes is that they would have basically muscular imbalances or there'd be imbalances throughout their their body where one muscle would be really short and then you look at another muscle and, and it'd be long or they wouldn't have really good control over it so uh one of the things then I, I started playing around with then is that if we know that you know uh, injuries injuries occur usually because there's a lack of awareness to a certain area the 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 joint doesn't really know where it is in relation to space. So to me, that's just a brain body awareness issue. So if that's the case, usually right around where injuries are, there is a lack of tone. There's a balance where one side has a lot of tone, where it's short, it's compressed, and another side is long, it's expanding, uh, and it doesn't have a lot of tone. And so this is where I found that if you essentially create tone where there's no tone, then that starts to essentially balance out the bottom of uh, the body. And so, you know, we talked about uh, meridian systems a little bit. I think you had a, a recent podcast about meridian systems. This starts getting into Dr. Jerry Tennant's work where he has mapped out, or not really him, but, you know, 
well, he's looked at it and other people have looked at it as well, but, you know, looking at what muscles influence what organ systems. And so then this continued to lead to, okay, this isn't just like a muscular imbalance that's causing some ligament you know, issues or a tendonitis or whatnot. This seems to be going more towards uh, organ functions, like an organ, like the yin and the yang of organs aren't firing right. So uh, then I started finding out that, okay, well now somebody's organs aren't firing right, which is affecting how somebody's muscle tone is, which now is affecting how you know, the muscles are firing, they're working, distributing force, etc. cetera. Um, and then this gets me to where I primarily try and work on is that then you look at organs and you realize that most organ systems are connected to emotions. So now, you know, you go from this physical standpoint, then you go to this, you know, transfer of energy, you know, through the, you know, the organ system, and then you figure out what controls all that. And it's, essentially the mind, it's consciousness. So where I'm at with training now is essentially trying to get each person that I work with to figure out who they are as a person. So discover their own identity, grow themselves, grow their consciousness, uh, and then just be able to discover, you know, what's going on within their body. And then once they start doing that, um, a lot of pain starts going away. People, you know, release or are going to be releasing toxins. Uh, and we can go into this with, you know, how we would go about this through exercise or whatever. But this is kind of the basic concepts is that uh, once you start understanding that a lot of times it's it can be linked to an emotion or an organ dysfunction, uh, that's usually how there, it leads to an imbalance of the tone, whether there's tone or no tone. So I know that was a lot there, but that's can, awesome. Can, can no, that's it. That's a lot to unpack in such a good way. I mean, because that does connect so many different levels of looking at the body. So let me try to kind of kind of recap. And so for those who don't know Jerry Tennant, because I don't think I've talked about him. Um, Jerry Tennant is, you know, has a lot of uh, books and talks on healing is voltage. And so it's this idea that cells need enough energy that he describes as ATP. I actually think it's more exclusion zone water, but basically it needs enough energy. Okay, cool, cool. So it needs enough energy in order to be able to um, do all the tasks it needs to do. And when there's an imbalance and that basically that, that muscles, like Jared is saying, muscles are connected in what he calls muscle batteries, right? So basically the meridians flow in a certain way and the ba the batteries kind of stack on top of each other. And so what we know about batteries is there's like a positive charge and a negative charge, right? And, and a flow needs to happen in a certain way. And if that flow is impaired because there's a lack of voltage, then you're going to get some sort of a short out in the system. Um, he includes teeth in it too. I mean, it's a fact, he's, he's, he's got some interesting concepts with that for sure. Now, what I'm connecting and with you is this idea too that um are you familiar with the researcher kirch k-e-r-c-h mm, i don't think so but maybe he, he's not super quantum but what he is he's found out is that tissue stiffness precedes disease and to, and and then what he found was that tissue stiffness is dehydrated it's he calls it's lacking it lacks plasticizing and so what he says when you can put water back into the tissue which is exclusion zone water the tissue heals the disease is not less likely to manifest itself so i feel like all of this yes. is interconnected um and so and so the fact that then you said that we're starting with emotion that then also ties to this idea that so many people especially i think it's german new medicine Yes, beautiful. <laughs> beautiful, right? That that emotions and traumas and things like that, those are really the just start the start of the disease process. And so like my take on this, and I think kind of flows with yours, is that a lot of people are exposed to some sort of a trauma, whether it's an emotional trauma or just like you said, a lack of direction, um, a lack of knowing where they where they are, who they want to be, uh, a physical trauma that gets embedded somewhere in the body. And I believe that that embedding can be a physical scar that impairs the connective tissue and dehydrates the connective tissue, or I believe it could be actually held as an emotion. And that also dehydrates the connective tissue. Because as a massage therapist, we would find knots and things, you know, and that, that then would release emotions in people as we rehydrated that, that tissue. And so then, and then ultimately, so it's like emotion changes the tissue, the tissue, when it changes, it impairs basically energy flow through the tissue, which really is associated with a certain organ system. And then that can drive some sort of a phenotypic disease process in the body. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Uh, yes. But I'll just say, uh, 
I'll just kind of not necessarily critique, but that was a really good recap. Um, so thank you. Uh, but it's, it's um, just as, you know, you mentioned German new medicine. So as soon as there's an emotional conflict or emotional shock to the system, because it's not necessarily just stress, it's something that really catches you off guard. And it can be there's something, you know, even in the womb or in, you know, from passed on from generations um, that you don't even really are aware of. But anyway, so it starts out as this emotion, which then affects the organs, which then affects the muscular, which is the, you know, whatever fascia connected tissue. Um, and then so this is the beautiful thing is that when we talk about healing ourselves, uh, we can start, you know, if you're not, if somebody's not really ready to start with the emotions, you can kind of go the other way. So you can start influencing the muscular system and gaining the awareness, balancing out the organs, which is then going to be distributing all these different, you know, releasing all these different emotions. Uh, and so it's, it's a very beautiful thing where it's, you know, and this, and I guess this is kind of the segment way of, of how I go into the, um, I'll talk a little bit about the training, but when I go about uh, training an athlete or exercises, we'll use things, sometimes they call them isometrics or extreme slows. So things that essentially you're holding a position and you're holding this position for three to five minutes. Um, now, I'm not necessarily interested in just somebody hanging out and holding a position. This is where, you know, I, I mentioned that most pain or injuries occur from a lack of awareness. Uh, where the body doesn't know where the limb is in relation to space. So I want a very mind-body connection here. I want you to be able to engage your consciousness, engage what's going on. And so this is where it's like, okay, you know, let's look at, can, can I engage my calf muscle? Like, can I squeeze it? Can I just like sit here, lay on the ground and can I engage it? Yes or no? How hard can I contract it? Does it, you know, if do I go and contract it and a different muscle contracts? And then you kind of go up, work your way up. Then you can try the quad. Maybe every single time you contract your quad, your glute fires. So there's this, this imbalance that a lot of people will have. And so uh, once you kind of figure out what you can't contract or what doesn't have tone, then you get into these like different isometric positions and you would hold those positions for an extended period of time. Uh, and what that's going to do is essentially just uh, it's, it's going to, I think it's the most efficient way to connect your brain to your body because we're, you're going to immediately, if you're holding something for five minutes, you're going to know, <laughs> you're going to know whether you can, uh, like how well you can contract it. Your body's going to start connecting, you know, joint positions and how to fire muscles, how to distribute force better. Um, but it takes that time. And a lot of people have a hard time wanting to do something for that amount of time, but that's, it, it takes that amount of work and it takes that amount of mindfulness. So it's, uh, it is something important to do, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. We can kind of segue from there. Yeah, no, that's awesome. So it's like, I like how you uh, preface this whole little segue of by saying you can, you like to, where people can kind of work backwards, right? If they're not ready to tackle traumas from their past, or maybe they didn't know they were exposed to a trauma in utero or a transgenerational trauma, they can work backwards. And it's like this idea of, you know, we always, I think there's an assumption in the, in the training world that, um, that there's something about like muscles that don't fire. It's like that it's a, it's, it's, it's this idea that they're weak or something along those lines, you know, it's, but it's like, I think there's like, what you're saying is there's a huge neuromuscular component to it where the nervous system for whatever reason, hasn't been directing energy to that particular area of the body. Right. And perhaps then the antagonist gets overly tight just because it can fire more. And so what we oftentimes try to do is we try to, it's like, we, we try to stretch this one more, or it's like, we're going to foam roll this one. And we try to lengthen this one out to balancing, but really we have to send the energy to the opposing muscle. The, that opposing muscle really needs to become aware of itself in space. And so it can then help balance tone, which I'm, I'm thinking you're saying is synonymous with, with balanced energy flow, but then also mm -hmm. it's like we're charging up that voltage in that yes. muscle group. And so yes. charging up that voltage provides more, a more energy for that, for the loop to complete itself, for the energy to flow appropriately through through the organ systems associated with it and, and all the things that can be associated with that energy flow. Would that be correct? Yes, that is 100% correct. And, and that's, that's kind of the philosophy that we, or I guess the opposing philosophy that's out there is that in order, you know, before you can strengthen a muscle, they say you have to lengthen the muscle and then strengthen it. 
strength and length go hand in hand. You can't separate those two things. So if you want to increase your range of motion, you have to be able to show your body that you can have the awareness there, you have the control and you have the strength. And then the, then the body can then give you the new ranges of motion. Um, and so that's exactly it, where it's rather than trying to stretch out my pecs, you know, or my, uh, you know, if my biceps short, rather than trying to stretch out my bicep, I'm going to need to learn how to engage my tricep. Because that means that the, sh the bicep is short. It's, it's essentially um, uh, excessively gathering energy. It's excessively, you know, excessively stealing energy from other organ systems, yeah. other meridian yeah. systems. And so, and then the muscle that is long is excessive or not excessively, but it's, um, it's, uh, it's deficient, right? It's deficient. Yeah. It's excessively discharging. Oh, yeah. And so it's, it, you know, it's doing all of this excessive discharge. And so what we need to do is that we need to recharge that up. So we need to balance it out. So one, you know, meridian system is not trying to steal from the other meridian system, um, and whatnot. So yeah, it's exactly it is you, you find those muscles that aren't toned, you create a tone there, you can create a concentric contraction. Um, and then that's going to fuel the energy. And so that would be like an example where it's, um, you know, let's take the hamstring quad. So if somebody's quads were super short or tight, then you would need to kind of get into a position that creates a concentric contraction with the hamstrings in order to then lengthen out the quads or redistribute the, the energy the way that it needs to be. Wow. That makes so much more sense on so many levels from my, just my, my background with personal training and massage and, <laughs> and quantum and quantum health. So yeah, absolutely. That makes a ton of sense. And I'm going to put my husband immediately into concentric ice <laughs> hamstring uh, isometric holds because his quads are continuously uh, overly tight and he, you know, he can't, he, he can't stretch them. Right. And so um, I think that's exactly what it is. I see that so many times in people. So then the coolest part about this is the fact that you're taking this not just to a, I want to balance my muscles out situation to maybe avoid injury in performance, but like this is next level, Jared. This is like, okay, and yes, you're going to do that. You're going to balance the tone of the muscles. You're going to balance the energy of the muscles out so that one muscle isn't stealing flow from another muscle, but that then, like you said, ties directly into the meridian system or direct ties directly into the flow of energy. So that's where I want, that's where let's connect it with people to this idea that fascia, it's how cool is it that fascia wraps every single muscle fiber, right? And that that fascia is made up of this connective tissue, collagen, triple helix, and literally inside of the triple helix of collagen are water nanotubes that form that ferry photons and electrons and protons all throughout the body, right? And so that's this idea then of how does the body know where it's at in space? Well, on the macroscopic level, you know, we've got, you know, proprioceptors and stuff, but on like that tiny subatomic particle level, it's because energy can flow and can then guide and tell the body what's happening instantaneously in one part of the body to the other parts of the body. Yes, yes, that's awesome. And, and if I add one thing to that, um, you know, I mentioned, you know, it's not about, getting somebody out of pain or balancing out the physical side. I, I, I mentioned that, you know, one of the number one things that I want anybody that works with me is to understand who they are as an individual. They need to know their identity. And you mentioned German New Medicine. And one of the things that happens from um, a conflict shock from, you know, that uh, happens to the, you know, the, the muscular system or the tendons, ligaments, whatever, is a, a self uh, devaluation or devalue, uh, uh, self devaluing essentially. Uh, so where you, um, you know, you might have some guilt, you might have some um, lack of identity, who you are as a person, you might be insecure. Uh, so a lot of these muscle or tendon tears or anything like that can be pointed back um, to those conflict shocks. And, and what we even know this from, because we know that um, it originates from the, you know, he breaks it down into German new medicine, breaks it down into um, the three different embryological, embryology, uh, embryology layers where you have the mesoderm, ectoderm, uh, endoderm or whatever, but the, uh, the structural components where your muscles, your tendons and ligaments come from the, uh, the mesoderm. And which is really interesting because that's also going to kind of contain a little bit of the, uh, of the, um, uh, the prefrontal cortex. And, and they found that in studies with ACL tears, that it actually creates a lesion in the brain and in, in the precentral cortex or um, 
Yeah, I believe it's the pre-central cortex. I'll have to I'll have to double check. Hopefully, I'm not getting it wrong. But and then what's also interesting is that we had another. Um, I was just in one of my classes, and we we're talking about um, uh, chiropractic care and how chiropractic adjustments uh, influence that same area. And so I, it was just uh, I'm just kind of connecting dots there, but. Um, I hope I got that brain area right, but if not, oh, oh well, I'll, I'll get it corrected. But uh, it just kind of co uh, connects the dots with me that the emotions are, you know, directly connected to the physical body being, and that's why it's not just okay. Well, let's look at somebody and figure out how to balance out their bicep and tricep. It's more of how can we, you know, engage their muscular, you know, their muscular system in a certain way that's then going to. Uh, you know, and develop their consciousness, make them more aware of themselves, uh, which is then ultimately going to make them more aware of their surroundings and their relationships with people and whatnot. So there's a much bigger picture to it uh, than just the physical side. But I just know that through the physical side, that's how we can influence people and, and kind of get them uh, to that direction. Absolutely. You take something, you take something that people want to do anyway. So there's a lot of people in this world who love working out and love exercising and you just guide it in a certain way that actually is way more impactful to their, the, the totality of their health as opposed to just simply how they move or maybe how they stand or how they perform. So that's, that's a, that's, that's powerful. It's powerful because just coming from a movement background myself, I can, and actually I want to know that part of the brain because, you know, my ACL, I tore my ACL, I tore my yeah. meniscus. Do you want to know what I found fascinating? And I don't know if you have anything to share on this is that all of my injuries as an athlete have happened all and, and, you know, not even not as an athlete, just randomly, like when I bump into things, it's always on the right side of my body. It's almost like it's trying to inform some part of my left brain, something, right. I don't know. Like there's, there's things that that's just probably, that's just a, a silly rabbit hole or a silly observation I had, but it's fascinating to me that the body maybe is doing it for a reason. Maybe there's a reason why one side of my body is uh, more injury prone than the other. Uh, who knows? Like the innate intelligence of the body. Yeah, no. And, and it, I just looked at my notes. It is the prefrontal cortex. Okay, cool. Cool. So, yeah. yeah. So yeah, no, that's, that's neat. That's neat. I, the, then the prefrontal cortex is what we're using for executive function too. Right. And so very cool. Very yeah. Cool. Um, yes. Very cool. And then, so now I want to go into a little bit more detail though. So it's not necessarily now just about, you know, the reciprocal inhibition or just the, the antagonist agonist. Uh, you also have to start breaking it down even further. So you got to think about how your biceps or calf muscles, your hamstrings, it's not necessarily one muscle strand. We, you know, we have different things where it's like you got the vastus lateralis, the medius, the intermedius. Um, and so you have these different um, muscular groups, the calf, you got a, you know, a medial head, a lateral head of, of the gastroc. So this is where it goes even further into, into depth is um, you also have to then figure out how to how do you have control or tone or lack of tone from left to right of your muscles and then you also have to think of how do i have it from uh from proximal to distal because a lot of people this is a very common pattern where you see like for the quads is that people will be very dominant on their vastus lateralis they won't have a lot of tone on their vastus medialis and then they'll also have more tone around their knee joints and then they won't be able to create a lot of tone up by their hip joints so it also starts going more in detail as well, where it's not just, okay, I'm going to contract my hamstring as hard as I can, or I'm going to contract my quad as hard as I can. You're trying to be very specific with the very particular point of the muscle that is not firing. And what's crucial about this is you got to think of if that area is not, and I say in quotations, firing, then we know that when our body is doing movements, when force is going through our body, it's not going to be distributed through that area. And that's how you kind of get overuse and in injuries where it's going to this area that's excessively toned and it's, your body's constantly using that. So it's a very easy way to get someone out of pain essentially is, is figuring out and going more in depth, left, right, you know, top, bottom, what doesn't have control, create tone there. Uh, and that also will start balancing things out. So it, it goes a lot more into detail and, you know, you can, even progress that even further into uh, gait patterns. So neurological, how your body, you know, reflexively fires through gait, you know, so, you know, if I have my, uh, you could like something simple where you'd be laying on your back and let's say you only, you hold a, an isometric contraction with your bicep and then the opposite. So your, your left arm is holding an uh, isometric of the bicep and then your right arm 
you are uh, contracting your tricep and you're doing it in a pulsing fashion where you're contracting, relax, contract, relax, contract, relax. And so then you begin, you know, you can slowly progress these things and, you know, you can do it all the way from laying on your back, which, you know, we talk about, you know, is, you know, when we're infants and we first start out, you know, we're usually on our back learning, reaching around, learning, you know, kicking our arms and our legs around. And then, you know, we begin to roll over, we begin to crawl, we begin to then to stand up, to walk, to run, to sprint. Uh, and we can, you know, and you see that same decline progression as we get older. So, and it's just as important. I mean, I even see this where it's like a 15, 16 year old. So maybe I can't fully say this, where it's a lot, a lot of times they need help just being on their back again mm -hmm. um, and figuring out control of, okay, just simply laying on your back and then doing a simple thing of, okay, going through a checklist and can you contract these muscles? Um, and if not, then, okay, those are the areas that we're going to focus on. So uh, I'll leave that at that. Yeah, that's, it, that's all there. very interesting stuff. What, so what really uh, stuck with me on that is the idea that let's, so people who don't understand like the fact that different muscles, they're kind of divided, if you will, like, you know, Western, Western medicine, or just in general, we like, we're reductionists, right? We like to divide things up into what we kind of look at as anatomical separations of like the same muscle. And so, so when you're saying that there's parts of muscles that fire more than others, it, I mean, it makes complete sense to me then that that's lacking piezoelectricity, right? It's lacking electrons there. And so again, that's another thing that you're looking at. It's this idea that, okay, yes, these other, the rest of the muscles looking to fire, those muscles are stealing electrons too, just so you have a muscle that might not be firing. You're trying to create tone. Well, there's certain parts of the muscle that are good, that are going to be discharging or not, maybe not pulling in electrons because of their inactivation versus other parts of the muscle that are going to hoard those electrons because of their activation. And if, if we're learning anything about all this, it's about maintaining like this balanced flow, right? Like, like you said, this goes back to the beginning. Things are cyclical, right? Things in nature. So, which is why the gait cycle is a perfect example with movement, right? That certain muscles fire as we're, you know, moving in a certain, our arm forward, certain muscles fire as they go back. So the exact same thing that's happening as a plant releases the carbon dioxide, I'm or releases the oxygen, I'm breathing in the oxygen and then taking out the carbon dioxide. And so it's, that's that idea that if any part of that cycle has some sort of a dysfunction or a lack of flow, then that could be impactful to the planet. <laughs> it could yeah. be impactful to my body. Right. And so that's actually so nuanced in a way that's powerful though, because I totally can know what's, what's the muscle that I've had to work on firing the most after my ACL reconstruction, my vastus medialis, right? Like it was took, took a while to get that bad boy to fire again. And so it, it makes sense how, how then there's other parts of my body that were stealing electrons. This one wasn't able to get the electrons and that impairs then flow on an energetic level on a meridian level. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. This is, this is wonderful. You, you, uh, uh, you get it. You, you have a very good understanding of it and it's good. So this is awesome. Uh, now you mentioned the piezoelectricity. And so this is where I'll, I'll say the piezoelectricity is very interesting or piezoelectricity, however people want to say it, <laughs> uh, is that uh, the thing that we have to think about is that uh, it's dependent upon certain things and it's going to be dependent upon uh, the force or the amount of force you put into it and then the rate that you make it fire. And so just as, you know, we have Wolf's law, which is, you know, you, you create stress to a bone, it grows or Davis's law, you create, you know, tension to the skin, it grows or, you know, plants the way that they blow in the wind and then their, you know, trunks grow, whatever. It's all connected. You know, if you apply some sort of stress, it's going to create some sort of adaptation. So this is why it's extremely important that I think is where you need to be able to maximally contract an area as hard as you can. Because if I contract a muscle as hard as I can, that's going to enhance the piezo effect. If I'm doing something where I'm only contracting at 10%, 15%, 60%, then I'm only gonna get 60, 10, 15% of the benefit from my perspective. So I'm always looking at, and this is even goes back to my background where I was in, uh, um, where I, for my senior year, I did independent uh, uh, study, like sports uh, studies. And, you know, I didn't understand a lot of the cognitive side. I was mainly only looking at the physical side, but, you know, I would take EMGs and people would say, you know, cause I, I worked with uh, baseball players and they'd say, Hey, this exercise is a great exercise to develop the, the you know, the posterior shoulder. And I'd say, okay, so we would take some, e, you know, some uh, EMGs and we put it on the shoulder. We would do the exercise. 
And then I would put EMGs and I would, and put it on when somebody would throw a baseball as hard as they can. And I look at the, the slopes of the graft and I would see how similar they, are, uh, similar they are. And I would notice that a lot of the rehab or a lot of the exercises that people were prescribing, uh, they would only, the, the slope was really slow. So to get to a peak contraction, it would take like a second or longer. And then you look at somebody who throws and when they throw, their muscle has to fire in like 100 milliseconds. So immediately that said to me, okay, there's a disconnect there where it's like, we're having all these sports injuries, but all of our training, the stress that we're putting on our athletes doesn't even compare to what their muscles are, you know, uh, experiencing during the competitive play. So why don't we try and figure out exer exercises that can mimic the same amount of intensity or be more intense than their actual sport. So then when they go and play their sport, whether it's sprinting, throwing or whatever, their body no, doesn't, you know, see it as a threat or whatever, and they can uh, essentially throw longer, harder, run faster, longer, et cetera, which is the case. Um, and so this, this ties right back into the piezoelectricity where it's, you need that time, you need that three to five minutes contracting as hard as you can to generate that piezoelectricity. Um, and that's going to be how I believe you're going to get the most optimal uh, benefit or the best bang for your buck. And you know, the way that I look at it too, is, um, one of the people that I kind of follow is that, or I began to learn, uh, uh, these, I guess to say these isometric positions from, I've, I've definitely changed, uh, a little bit about it, but essentially, you know, he would, he would make an argument, which one is more destructive to the body. Is it jogging or sprinting? And everybody would say, well, it's, it's probably sprinting because most, you know, injuries occur, you know, during sprinting or hamstring or whatever. And he would say, no, it's jogging because when you jog, your body is only firing at 40 to 60% of a contraction. When you sprint a hundred percent contraction has to occur to be able to stabilize your muscles. So he would make the argument that it's actually more dangerous to jog than it is to sprint. Uh, so I'm just kind of tying this back where it's, it's, I see it as it's if we want to be able to, you know, run the marathon or run the 5k, the 10k in order to train for it, rather than just training at 30 to 60%, to me, it makes more sense of doing something at hundred percent intensity or as close to it as possible uh, in order to prepare your body for whatever stimulus that you're going to be giving it essentially. Uh, and so that's where, you know, I see piezoelectricity playing a huge role. And then obviously something we haven't talked about, but it's scalar energy is also going to have a profound effect on that as well, which, you know, the, the scalar is going to be essentially your consciousness. And it's not something that we can uh, create or anything. It's, it's just an existence. And it's something that we're able to tap into uh, whenever we want. But uh, we can go into that in a little bit later. I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole. But <laughs> so I want to say the piezo is, is important and how you engage your muscles and the duration is very important along with the positions your joint positions uh and like i said the the medial lateral proximal distal everything matters uh so it, it, it goes very in depth cool i mean yeah i feel like i feel like we i feel like we could chat for three hours jared because there's so much to unpack here um but i like i like how you're laying this out in kind of a structural or a, in an ordered way where people can start to maybe explore it themselves. The first thing that I, that, that came to me was this idea that you said, um, the muscle has to contract maximally. Um, and so when you contract it maximally for these three to five minutes, are you getting people just to contract maximally? Like, like you said, against the floor. So am I literally just laying on my back, pushing my pinky and my tricep into, to, to, uh, into the floor to activate this, the whole backside of my arm to do it? Am I doing it just with my own body weight or am I doing it using equipment, using machines? Yes, that is a beautiful question. So the way that I see it and the way that I, this is just my personal opinion. Cool. But anytime we're doing anything, we're trying to uh, learn a movement, do a movement or whatever, I think we need to be able to know how to do the movement uh, without any sort of external stimulus. Because I want to develop the consciousness. I want to develop the brain body connection. If you push your hand as hard as you can into like an overcoming isometric into the ground, or, you know, you, you uh, have a barbell and you push the barbell up against a rack or something, you are relying on the external force to generate the contraction. Now it's interesting. I mean, your body is going to fire, like it, it's going to, because it, it has to, but the way that I see it is it's much more profound to 
figure out how to contract it yourself. Because if you don't know how to con you know, control it yourself, then how are you going to control it um, optimally when you go into those more stressful overcoming isometrics? And the same way I see it is like, you know, you, you go and throw, you know, we tell the, our athletes all this the time, you know, when you go and pitch, are you going to go pitch with a barbell on your back? No, you're not. So I need you to know how to fire, you know, your internal rotators. I need you to know how to engage your feet. I need you to know how to do all of this without any sort of external stimulus. Now, once you know how to do that, then we can get into more, you know, challenging things to say. So yes, that is a really good question. So it's, it, to me, it doesn't necessarily matter fully. I mean, it does a little bit how you do the isometrics, but ideally where you want to start is having an idea of, again, of what has tone, what doesn't have tone. And that's interchangeable for me of what do you have control of and what you don't have control over. Because what you'll find is that like, if you don't have good control of your internal rotators and you try and contract them, you're going to notice that as you begin to contract, relax, contract, relax, there's going to be times where you have a hard time even relaxing the muscle, where it's just going to be stuck in this like contractive state, because again, you're just, you're, you're in the, the elementary stages of learning how to regain awareness to that area and redistribute force to there. And so it's also interesting to note too, because I mentioned that the, the EMGs and the graphs or whatever, you know, if you want your body to be protected, you need it to be able to contract. And more importantly, you need it to be able to relax super fast. I mentioned, you know, you know, injuries occur in less than hundred milliseconds. And I would even argue that it's even faster than that. But um, I think you've already even alluded that on some previous podcasts, but we won't fully go into that. But all I'll say on that is that there's enough studies out there that show that the brain rehearses a movement two times uh, before the movement even occurs. Uh, so whatever we're measuring is just, it's an after effect. It's something that's long gone, <laughs> essentially. Wow. Um, and so uh, what I'm getting at this is though, it's, uh, you gotta, so the, the starting with being able to have the awareness, what can you contract, what can you not contract? And then you get into things where, you know, we mentioned gait. So now, you know, um, I look at it as if you want to be able to walk good, if you want to be able to uh, jump or anything like that, you need to be able to know how to sit, you need to know how to stand, you need to know how to breathe, you need to know how to walk, and all those things, different components are going to be like, okay, well, now you're going to hold a lunge. Um, okay, you need to figure out how to transition from a walk. So maybe you're going to hold a single leg race. So you're going to learn how to stand on one leg and engage certain muscles. Um, you know, maybe you're going to... Um, you're going to learn how to jump. Okay. Well, if you want to learn how to jump, you need to learn how to be able to sit. So then you're going to learn how to essentially sit. And then if you need to stand, then you're going to learn how to stand and you want to learn how to use the appropriate muscles in whatever direction you're going. So, you know, there, if you, you know, if you go down rabbit holes of, of isometrics, people are going to have their staples where it's going to be like a wall set, a lunge, a bicep curl, a scap hang, or like a dead, you know, where they, you know, hang from a pull-up bar. Uh, there might be an ab crunch or a glute ham or something like that. But to me, it's, it's, I don't want to, it's, it gets too complicated. So we're not going to go into all of that right now, but I think a good starting point is just no matter the position you get into, you should be able to know how to control your muscles in that position. Sure. I think that's just a good point to, or a good way to start. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Just this idea of becoming more aware of your body in space. I think that, I think a body awareness benefits everybody on so many levels and people don't realize how it actually really is potentially impacting their, their overall consciousness. Um, but so here's, let, let's take this person, right? The average person. So let's say I'm a desk worker and I would say that we can all, anyone who's ever worked with a human body before, you know, or has a body even, and has been a desk worker, it's like, okay, what, what do we see? Right. Well, like potentially more tone in the hip flexors, less tone in the glutes, more tone in the pecs, less tone in the mid back, you know? Um, so, so taking someone like that, is it, is, is it truly as simple for them as, as let's redistribute the energy, let's use isometrics to allow their muscles to redistribute their energy so that all of these meridians on the posterior chain are actually getting a little extra attention and a little extra flow and a little extra energy and electricity running through them. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. So, and that, I mean, and that's essentially, you know, you, you mentioned, so if somebody's hip flexors don't work or whatever, then they, and this is another key thing too, is you'll hear people talk about, 
uh, length, you know, being able to control a muscle in length, but it's not about how controlled, or I should say this like this, what really matters is how can you like in the longest range of motion possible, uh, how can you maintain a concentric contraction? Mm -hmm. So if I have my hamstrings in the most lengthened position, or I have my quads in the most lengthened position, like if I'm doing a sissy squat, let's say with my quads and my knees are going over my toes, a lot of times where people run into trouble is where they think, okay, I'm lengthening my quads because I'm, you know, I'm learning to control my muscles in this lengthened state. But what they forget is it's about how uh, well can you create a concentric contraction in a lengthened state? So it's not about an eccentric contraction at all. It's about being able to t uh, create a concentric contraction in a lengthened state. Uh, and so other things where you can see with that is like the pec muscle, you know, so you mentioned a lot of times people's pecs are, might be short or whatever. So then if somebody were just to do a bench or have their arm out to their side with the other hand, they could, you know, uh, palpate their pec area, you know, put it in a shortened position. Okay. Can it contract? Okay. Now I slowly move my hands, you know, out to that side, which is going to lengthen my pec at what point can you no longer contract your pec? Mm -hmm. Okay, now stop there and now do either hold your, you know, that pec muscle for three to five minutes, or you could do pulses where you contract as hard as you can, then relax, contract as hard as you can, relax. And you're working that um, so then you can figure out how to uh, create that. Now, the other thing you could do though is, you know, you could say, okay, hey, I can contract my pec with my arm directly in front of me like a front delt raise. And then you could immediately move it out to the side and then very lengthened state and then contract, concentrically contract your pec as hard as you can. So I don't know if those are helps yeah. clarify, but it, uh, it does. that's what we're kind of looking for. It, no, it absolutely does. I, I, and I, like I said, I think that I need to take some of the courses that you offer and that you're, right. you're, you're training, you're training this sort of stuff for like, for people like, like me, right. Who are interested in, in learning more about this whole method. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's the thing I I'm, I'm super intrigued because I think quantum health, a lot of people come at it from the lighting perspective, um, or, you know, the grounding perspective or the blocking artificial light at night perspective. And this is an amazing thing because you are totally impacting quantum health from a movement perspective. And it's a very unique way of looking at it. But I think that this can tie to so many people. And if we can start translating this type of training to people who are young and just getting into sports and stuff, that just has such an um, overall better impact on their their being <laughs> on their yeah. energy flow on so many things and it'd be, it'd be fascinating to see a study on on disease prevention right when you have this cohort of people that you've worked with from age 10 onward you know and now they're in their 90s right it's like were they able to maintain energy flow through the meridians because of this awareness that allowed them then to you know live a healthier life because they had the appropriate I guess yeah. electricity is the appropriate flow. It's, it's so fascinating. Uh, I know we're wrapping up Jared here, but like anything that you want to add to this, because I think we might need to do a part two. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will, I will briefly talk about uh, the breath. So, yes. I mean, you, you mentioned that whole study, but you know, ancient Chinese medicine has essentially been doing it, but not through movement or exercise. They've been using it through breath work or, uh, or out in you know India where they do polar uh, polarity and they're working on different charges. So, you know, you can draw parallels in different areas of how people have, you know, uh, I guess maintained uh, a certain well-being if we want to put a number on it. But uh, I'll segue into the the breath work. And what's very interesting to me is that. Um, we have this, uh, you know, we, we know about, uh, autonomic or, you know, nervous system, whatever, and everything is supposed to happen automatically as, you know, is what we're taught. But the one thing that we can use to influence all of those automatic systems is our breath. And then the way that we change our breath, depending on whether it's breathing in a parasympathetic, parasympathetic style or a sympathetic style, uh, breathing through your nose, your mouth, um, how you breathe, the duration, a diaphragmatic breathing, all of that is going to impact the rest of, you know, how your, you know, blood pumps through, how your lymphatics are moving, et cetera. So where I'm getting at this is that one of the most important things that I see is while you're doing these isometrics and you're trying to maximally contract, what people forget to do is they'll forget to breathe. 
And as soon as you forget to breathe, because you're, you're putting so much attention, even if it's simple as laying on your back and all you're trying to do is figure out how to contract your bicep without contracting your tricep, or you're trying to figure out how to contract your quad without engaging your glute or whatever, because that intention's going there, you're going to, you're not going to be able to <laughs> breathe properly. And, and uh, once you experience it for yourself, you, you might giggle. But uh, anywhere I'm going at this, as soon as you stop breathing, you're not really directing the energy flow anymore is how I see it. And so in order to maintain the most efficient energy transfer going throughout the body is we need to be, be able to uh, breathe properly. And so that's how I see things is where, okay, you know, you can put it as, um, okay, I'm going to figure out how to contract my pec as hard as I can. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to breathe in for four, pause for one, exhale for eight, pause for one, and I'm going to repeat. Um, you could even do where it's okay. I'm going to do 12 sets of in for three, pause for one, out for six, pause for one. And then I'm going to do that 12 times and then, okay, then I'm done. So rather than doing three to five minutes or a contract, relax, where you're doing 500 pulses or something like that, you're going off of your breath because a lot of times, you know, people get into it and they can't breathe. Uh, and if you can't breathe properly, you're not going to, you're going to die. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> so you so. got to be able to breathe. So anyway, where I'm getting it is, is with this is that the breath is so powerful because it, it influences how our body directs energy now we can also listen to our breath with this as well this also goes to an awareness so your breath is a reflex so if i were to palpate a certain area on your body it can send your breath up high to your shoulders or it could send your breath down into your pelvic floor just by the, the reflex standpoint of it. So if I put you in a, in a position or have you do something that your body is like, oh my gosh, I don't know what's going on. This is so chaotic. Your breath is going to shoot up high. And then you would have to, if you recognize that, then you have to figure out how do I get my breath now into essentially back to a parasympathetic state and back uh, down into my belly button, essentially, or below my belly button is how I see it. Not really uh, belly breathing. But uh, what I mean by this is that when we first inhale, we want our rib cage to, this is a kind of off topic, but we want our rib cage to be able to expand and compress. It's not necessarily just the belly breathing. But what I look for is that the first initial area that moves essentially is the pelvic floor, because if the pelvic floor engages, then that means all of the organs are going to be able to sit down into the pelvic floor. And then the further they go down, then they're going to compress back up. Mm -hmm. So while you're doing these things, you want to note where your breath is, is essentially where I'm getting at. And uh, some tips that people can have too when they go with this is that a lot of times when people get like it, a lot's going on, they're trying to contract a muscle, they're holding a position for five minutes. It's tough. It's really hard. You're going to sweat. You're going to breathing is going to be out of control. You're going to start mouth breathing. And you hear all the time uh, nasal breathe. You got a nasal breathe. You got a nasal breathe. And you got to do this parasympathetic uh, type of style. So one tip that I usually give people, and this usually helps, uh, I mean, I haven't seen it where it hasn't helped, but what I find is that you want to meet the body where it's at. So if your body is in a stressful state, if all you do is a, a parasympathetic type of breathing where you're trying to maintain this in for four, out for eight, only through the nose, uh, you're just creating more chaos inside of your body. So what I find is if you switch to something that's more of a sympathetic type of style where you're rapidly breathing in and out, maybe, you know, uh, kind of more like a Wim Hof style and you do that and then your body begins to balance out and then maybe you, you go to a Wim Hof style in and out through your nose and then maybe you work on certain breath counts and then you work your way back to the in for four, out for eight. Um, and so it's not just, you know, okay, you're in a position, fight it. You know, you're fighting the position and then you're fighting your breath, but rather again, recognize where you are. How can you harness the energy? How can you create this coherency to harmonize the energy, get everything back into rhythm and then bring the body back down into the parasympathetic state? You, you answered my question because my question was going to be, well, we're asking the muscles to fire maximally, right? Which seems like it should be a more sympathetic uh, drive to that area of the body. And so are, I was asked, I was wondering, are we creating some sort of a mismatch if we're only doing parasympathetic breathing? But that's perfect. You allow them. And then my, also, my brain also went to, well, maybe we want at first, especially to create a parasympathetic response in conjunction with that maximal muscle contraction, because 
we don't want the body to think that a maximal muscle contraction is a stress is a stressor, right? So like, if I'm looking to be a pitcher, like a, or throw the ball really hard, I maybe want to have that initial viewpoint as it being not a stressful position for the body. And so it's just fascinating how you tied that all together. I, I really love it. Um, and you know what, I'm really excited to kind of explore this in my own body. And then I, I think I'll have a way better I guess I'll just have some perspective with which I can come back to you and be like, Hey, Jared, let's chat around too about like, what are these things that my body experienced? And like, what are ways that where I, where you've seen this and where we can progress that? Because this is really, really cool how you're tying so many dots and uh, I'm just excited. I'm excited. So for people who want to learn more about what you're doing, where can they connect with you? Yeah. So the, uh, to see more, you can go to my Instagram page, which is uh, train efficiently, but it's train double underscore. Uh, efficiently however i'm not on there anymore i've totally gotten off social media uh and so now i'm i'm on discord so if you go on there i'll say i'm not here go to my discord <laughs> <laughs> awesome. and uh so essentially my discord channel though is like a a patreon so there you can uh have access to um conversations that i've had with uh coaches and because i do a lot of coaches uh, education so there's things on there like that there's things where we break down these compensations how to identify tones uh, and then there's also things where i've taken where because originally my coach's education course was a three month long process uh, and essentially i took that three months and i just made a uh, courses about it so there's a part one and part two uh, and there's probably over 20 hours worth of contents just alone in those courses uh, so that's another way that you can kind of figure stuff out as well Super cool. No, that's awesome. Um, I will definitely link that then below in the notes. So Jared, thanks so much for taking the time and just really opening my mind to uh, the exercise connection to the quantum health. I really, really appreciated this conversation. Awesome. I thoroughly enjoyed it as well. So thank you for having me. Absolutely. We'll talk soon.